Amen. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. We're going to be jumping into our series, Romans, the Gospel for All. But hey, welcome to Grove Youth. Uh, and last week we had an awesome time. This room was packed with families. So we had like 160 uh, students, family members, and leaders in this place last week. Uh, and I think it's just such a fun way to kick off the semester. But I don't want to lose any of that momentum headed into tonight. So uh, we're going to, like I said, we're going to be continuing this series. And if you weren't here uh, last week, let me just fill you in. Uh, we are studying the book of Romans for pretty much all of the fall semester. So we're going to be doing this all the way into December. And I know that sounds like a long time, but I, I hope you guys get excited about that because it's one thing to just like talk about a few verses here and there uh, or to like listen to a sermon, but it's another thing to really dive into God's word and try to just extract as much of the truth that God has in there for us. And so that's really what this series is all about. Last week, we got some context for the book of Romans. Uh, we talked about the guy who wrote it. His name is Paul. The Apostle Paul was writing this letter to the church in Rome. And to this day, today, it is regarded as one of the most significant works ever, even of the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 or 14 books of the New Testament. So in chapter 1, Paul told the Romans that he was eager to share the gospel because he was unashamed of the gospel, because he understood the full power of the gospel. This, of course, led us to talk about what the gospel is, and we dove deep into how Paul describes the power of the gospel. Uh, I know I've already plugged it once, but we're going to be posting uh, these sermons on our YouTube channel. Uh, last week's isn't up yet, but uh, this week and last week are going to be up uh, fairly soon, so you guys can be checking that out if you want to get caught up. And so really we talked about if we want to be like Paul, then we need to do this. We need to share the gospel eagerly and unashamedly. And that really comes from knowing the power of the gospel. So if you are a believer, if you follow Jesus, if the good news of Christ has changed your life, then you should know and understand the power of the gospel. And that should lead you to go and share the gospel eagerly and unashamedly wherever you go. That's what I want us to be doing with our lives. And really, last week, we started off with this challenge and this call to Grove Youth to get into action, going and sharing Jesus with others eagerly and unashamedly, just like Paul. That was last week, uh, but it's a new week, and we have more scripture to cover. So this week, we're going to be diving into Romans chapter 2. But before we do that, since we're going to be focusing on the beginning of Romans chapter 2, I want to do two things. One, I want to remind you guys don't just focus on the verses we read here on Wednesday nights. Last week, we talked about three verses out of like 30-something, and this week, we're talking about four out of 20-something, I think. So I want you guys to be in God's Word the rest of the week, and from week to week, even though we're talking about a handful of verses or maybe just a, a short chunk or passage at a time, I want you guys to be diving in and exploring and learning from the rest of the chapter throughout the week. So with that being said, now I want to give us a little bit of backstory from Romans chapter 1, the very end of Romans 1, as we get into uh, chapter 2. So let me read these verses for you guys. They're on the screen. Don't worry about turning to this yet. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 30 and 31 say this. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, uh, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, uh, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Here the Apostle Paul is writing to the Romans about the unrighteousness of people, specifically those that he says suppress the truth. Now I think we can agree this is a, a pretty bad list of things. I mean, like inventors of evil. Like, you invent the evil? That sounds worse than stealing barbecue sauce, guys. Like, that is, that's pretty bad if you're inventing evil. You guys, you guys can laugh about it. It's okay. Like I said, I've repented, okay? So, uh, and it kind of goes into what we're about to talk about. Paul knows that as the Jewish audience reads that list of sin, that they're like, yeah, that's bad. Yeah, God, go take care of those filthy, dirty, unrighteous sinners. Go, go take care of them. Let your, let your justice, let your uh, judgment just pour out over these horrible people. 
But Paul expected and he predicted that response. So when Paul continues into chapter 2, and just a side note, like as we study scripture together, when I say like as Paul continues into chapter 2, Paul just wrote a letter. We went back and added chapter numbers and verse numbers and little subheadings to help us organize scripture so that way uh, people can be like, hey, turn to chapter 2, verse 1. But Paul didn't write it like that. So when I say that, keep in mind Paul is writing a, a, a whole letter here and one stream of thought. And obviously, he covers different things throughout the letter. But when I say, like, now we're going to get into chapter 2, it's not that Paul was like, end this thought here and now new thought. Because really, he says that list of bad things and then jumps right into what we're going to be talking about tonight. And that's going to be chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So Paul predicts that the Jewish uh, readers of this letter are going to think, man, these people are the worst. And so Paul writes this. Therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Verse 2, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Before we get into like our, our main points for the night, I just want to make something very clear. Because I think sometimes people use this passage to say, see, judging people is the issue. Judgment of others is the sin, is the problem. But... Scripture does not condemn every type of judgment. Scripture doesn't say judging is bad all the time. There's, anytime we talk about judgment, there's all these little like nuances that we need to keep in mind. And really, we need to read the text carefully here. Instead, we are, like, instead of just taking that and saying, man, it must be bad to judge, we need to look at scriptures like John chapter 7, where Jesus tells us that we must judge rightly or righteously. And so, Erica, if you'll put those verses back up there, notice that Paul does not condemn them for judging. Instead, he says they condemn themselves because they practice the same things they judge others for. I'm going to say that again. The sin here, the issue with the Jewish readers that Paul is addressing, isn't that they are judging. It's that they are guilty of the same sins that they are accusing others, and that they are judging others for. So we need to be really careful how we read this text and make sure that we don't just look at it and go, oh yeah, it's bad to judge people. That's not exactly what Paul is getting at. And that's going to take us to our first point of the night. We need humility instead of hypocrisy. Paul is calling out the hypocrisy of the group that is reading this letter. What that means is he's saying, hey, you abide by this moral, you say you abide by this moral standard. You say you do these things. You look at other people and say, oh, you guys must be horrible for doing that stuff. But when God looks at your life, he sees that you do the same things. In our own pride, we can be so quick to point out others' sins and failures. In our pride, we make ourselves hypocrites judging people by a standard that we don't live up to ourselves. Instead, we need humility. We need to humbly understand our sinfulness in comparison to God's holiness. What that means is that God is perfect. God does no wrong. He is so much better than we can even imagine. And as we spend time getting closer to God, if you follow Jesus, if you really get close to God, he will start to show you how great he is, how holy he is, and you'll start to understand how deep the roots of sin really reach into your life. You'll start to really understand the impact of sin in your life. And as you do that, you'll be exposed to how much sin you have. And in that, you will become more understanding. You will become less judgmental in the bad, sinful way. And you will become more humble. All right, let me tell you a story uh, from the life of a friend, okay? This is going to be anonymous, and he did tell me I have permission to share this story. And in a way, it's a little bit funny, and in another way, it's serious, and it's actually like a perfect example of this, needing humility instead of 
hypocrisy. So I have a friend who was in a relationship with a girl in high school, and they regularly engaged in sending each other inappropriate pictures, okay? This is illegal, it's sinful, and it got them in trouble at school, all right? Once adults found out about what had happened, I think the way the story goes is the girl ended up telling some friends, friends told teachers, whatever, and before my friend knew that he had been caught, he was at basketball practice that afternoon, Okay, and the coach had heard about the incident. So the coach already knows who did what and what went down. And the coach is frustrated and he's disappointed in his player, my friend, that he would act this way. He's going to have to uh, punish him. He's going to have to bench him for a while. And so he decides to bring the team together, huddle up, and he starts talking to them about this incident. He's talking about, and how would you feel if this happened to your sister, if somebody was asking your sister for these things, or if, if, if one of your friends was acting like this towards a, a girl you cared about, and my friend confidently answers, I'd kill him. I'd kill that guy. Like, if somebody asked my sister for that sort of stuff, if somebody treated my sister that way, I would kill them. And it's like, okay, well, I don't think you should probably be killing anybody. But he answered confidently that he would kill him. And that as he answers in that confidence, in that pride that, man, if somebody were to do that thing, man, that would be out of line. And he said that the coach just looked at him kind of strangely and confused and disappointed. And he still didn't understand that the coach already knew it was him. He still didn't understand that he was the guy that he said he would kill. And just like that, in the beginning of Romans chapter 2, you have these religious, law-keeping Jewish people saying, man, the people from Romans chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, God should kill them. God should condemn them. God should judge them. God should punish them. And Paul says, it's you. You're the man that you want these things to happen to. You are just as guilty. We need humility instead of hypocrisy. The point is, like Christians, man, we are often already seen as hypocrites. I know if you have been a believer for a long time, if you have friends that aren't, that, that know you're a believer, they've probably said something to you before about, man, I don't like Christians. They're, they're hypocrites. And they say this, they, they always, you know, I see them going to church on Wednesday nights, I see them going to church on Sunday mornings, but when they're at school, they always act a different way. And sometimes they're right. Now, part of that is because we are sinful, we are fallen, and we shouldn't be automatically treated like we should be perfect just because we follow Jesus. But the issue is a lot of times we're kind of fine being hypocrites. We need humility instead of hypocrisy. We need to seek out humility through Jesus and ditch our hypocrisy. That's verse 1. Let's reread verses 2 and 3. It says this, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Paul asks, do you suppose, oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? In verse 2, Paul is talking about the fact that the judgment of God, the fact that all of us will be judged by God, it's always going to be right. That's important because if God could get things wrong, then he wouldn't be God. But God judges us Right, and he also judges us way beyond what we can see. He judges us way beyond the surface. He he judges people regardless of what they might say with their words, regardless of what they might present to the world on the outside. God sees beyond that and judges based on who he knows they truly are. Let me say it this way. We need obedience instead of an image. We need obedience instead of image. The Jewish religious law keepers, the Pharisees of this time, and it was all about image. They were praying in the streets just so people would see them pray. They were adding laws about the Sabbath just so they could look holier than other people. They only cared about this outside image. And Paul says, God knows behind the scenes, you do all the same things that these other people do. You do all the same things that you condemn people for, but you just want to look good on the outside. I know that it's a very different context that Paul is writing to, but I think we see a lot of the same things in our culture right now. We live in in a pretty affluent area. I know that's not saying that everybody in this room, their families have a lot of money or they're doing really well. I'm not saying that, but just in general, in this area, people are typically doing okay. All right, and so 
With that, we have families that tell their kids things like, hey, don't go to school and talk about the fact that, that so-and-so just had to go to jail. Don't talk about the fact that, that your dad struggles with alcoholism or drugs. Don't go and talk about this because they don't want their family to be embarrassed. They don't want their reputation to be ruined. Kids are told to keep things secret so that they're not an embarrassment, so that they don't seem less than perfect. When kids know that they've been, that they have a picture, that they've been in a picture that maybe their parents took and they post it online, like all the first day of school pictures that were just taken within the last couple weeks, there are little kids that are asking mom and dad, hey, how many comments did that get? What are people saying? Did they think I looked cute with the shoes? Or did I wear the right first day of school shoes? How many likes did it get? We have, we have kids who care about influencers, social media influencers. They care about follower counts and subscriber counts. We are teaching our kids, including you all, to care about our public image from a young age. And it is okay to care about your reputation and to care about your public image, but it is not okay to put it above your actual obedience, your actual godliness. The issue is that we often don't let people see the real us. And a lot of times that results in us just becoming a fake version of ourselves. If you act a certain way long enough, likely you are that shallow person. Likely you are that person that that just cares about your appearance. Likely you are the person that's just seeking an image. A man named Blaise Pascal said something that I think relates to this perfectly. He said this, there are only two kinds of men or people. The righteous who believe themselves sinners and the rest, sinners who believe themselves righteous. He says that there, there are those who are considered righteous because of the righteousness of God. That's something that we talked about last week, that if you are a believer, if you have put your faith in Jesus now, the righteousness of God, a righteousness that you can't accomplish, that you can't obtain, is now given to you as a new status. And so Blaise Pascal is saying here that, You're one of two people. You have either received God's righteousness, and part of that is you knowing and understanding that you are a sinner, or you are a sinner who doesn't understand God's holiness, and you don't understand your own sin, and therefore you're just self-righteous. You've just made yourself feel like you're righteous. You've just made yourself feel like you're good enough, but deep down, you are still a sinner. Verse 2 points this out by saying that it doesn't matter if you have convinced yourself that you're righteous. That self-righteousness is nothing compared to the holy and perfect judgment of God. Verse 3 goes on to question them, saying, do you really think that you can escape the judgment of God based on your works or based on your outward image? Do you really think that you can just kind of have this shallow image that will convince people and maybe even convince God that you are good enough. There's a a commentary that I'm reading, studying for uh, this series, and the guy who wrote it, his name's R. Kent Hughes, he says this, hell will be full of judgmental, goody, goody people. That's a scary thought. Hell will be full of judgmental, goody, goody people. That's right, the people who you'd say, man, that's, that's a good dude right there. Or, man, I'm just trying to be the the best I can be. I'm just hoping the good outweighs the bad. Guys, these are such common thoughts. That was my exact thought on God before I knew the gospel. I thought as long as I could stack up a list of goods that outweighed the bad. And that kind of thought I could game the system. I know I'm going to do this. I know I'm going to do that. I know I'm going to treat this person like that. I know I'm going to do that even though I shouldn't. But if I volunteer for enough stuff, if I look a certain way, if I do the best I can do, then I can outweigh it. I can game the system, and I might just be able to convince God I'm good enough for this place called heaven. And in reality, when we do that, we're just filling up hell with judgmental, goody, goody people. The good people you know, if they don't know Jesus, if they are not children of God, adopted into his family, then they are not saved, and they are going to hell. And that brings us to verse 4. Romans 2, 4 says this, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? He asks these people, just because you experience God's kindness, just because you experience his forbearance, just because you experience his patience, do you let that think? that he's just perfectly happy with the way you're living your life. What they're doing here is 
confusing the fact that just because they're experiencing goodness of God, just because they're experiencing common grace, just because they're experiencing love from God, maybe they just have happiness in their life, they think, well, then God must not be mad at me. My sin must not be a problem because I'm living a comfortable or a happy life. You all, we cannot let comfort become our God. We cannot let happiness in this lifetime become that idol. Ultimately, they just believe that their Jewish surface-level law-keeping ways will be sufficient to make it to heaven. They believe that their works will be enough to lead them from eternal death to eternal life and that they can just be good enough for God. And Paul condemns this thought process, telling them that they have missed the mark and that instead, all of that goodness from God, all of that kindness, all of that forbearance, all of that patience should lead them to one thing. It should lead them to come to God and to repent, to turn away from the life that they're living and live a new life following him. So what does that mean for us? It means that we need Christ's work instead of our work. We need Christ's work instead of our work. Y'all, our good works will never be enough to save us. Like I said, we cannot confuse a happy, comfortable life with a life of obedience to God. Instead, We need to cling to Jesus. We need to depend on him alone for our salvation and not anything that we can do. This is going to sound harsh, but I believe it to be true. Scripture says that our good works are like filthy rags to God. It doesn't mean he doesn't want us to do good works. Scripture also says that he created us to do good works, that he lays them out in front of us, that he wants you to live a life doing good things, but compared to his holiness, compared to how good and perfect God is. It's just filthy rags. That's not bad news. It just leads us to the good news. Instead of depending and relying on what we can do, we get to depend on Jesus. We can know that he lived the life that you and I could not, that we cannot, even when we're doing the best works we could possibly do, And then beyond that, he died the death that you and I deserve for all of our sins so that when we put our faith in Jesus, we could be reconciled back to God. I know that Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome, and I know that this part in particular is towards these religious Jewish people, but you all, the same gospel that he is telling them about, the same gospel he is eager to preach is still good news for us today. It truly is the gospel for all. There's a reason that's the name of this series. This is the gospel for all, even to this day. So tonight, as we get close to wrapping up, I want to tell you that if you have never placed your faith in Jesus, if maybe you just know it's time, maybe you feel convicted of your sin for the first time, or maybe you've been feeling convicted about that thing that you do that you don't want other people to know about, or the way you talk about your friends behind their back, or whatever it might be. Maybe you've been feeling guilty about that, but you don't even know why. It's because the law of God is written on your heart. And maybe you feel like Jesus is just knocking at the door of your heart, just saying it's time. It's time to change. It's time to give your life to me. Maybe you realize that you have been living a life based on your works. You've been living a life of hypocrisy. You've been living a life of shallow self-righteousness, and you realize it isn't enough. If that's you, then when we close tonight, after I pray, I want you to find me or any other leader and just ask them what it means to follow Jesus. What it means to be able to depend on his work instead of your own. What it means to be able to grow close to him and to have Christ-like humility and to have obedience to God. If you feel that tonight, please don't leave here without taking that step to just talk to a leader. Just have a conversation. We're not asking you to come down front in front of all your peers. Nothing like that. No response song tonight. Instead, we just want to offer a conversation to you. Grove Youth, we need humility instead of hypocrisy. We need obedience instead of image. And we need Christ's work instead of our work. As we leave here, I want you to seek humility in Jesus. I want you to seek obedience to the Lord. And I want you to cling to the work of Christ for your salvation.